So I'd like to welcome Dr. Jay Levine. He's Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health at North Carolina State University, Department of Marine, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences in the College of Sciences. He teaches classes focused on natural hazards such as floods and tsunamis, and he co-directs the department's climate change and society graduate program. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today uh, during what's, what are some pretty challenging times. Uh, in, the, in the past 60 years, each decade has been hotter than the last, and 221 is on the same path. And my job this evening is to call you to action. So in this hour, I'm going to give you a little introduction to the documented evidence arguing that, arguing that our planet is warming. And, but I'm going to start by talking about uh, COVID-19. It reflects what happens when there isn't community co awareness, consensus, and political will that act to mitigate a challenge. Little will happen to mitigate climate change if we don't create the political will to make a difference. So when COVID-19 was first identified as a potential health threat, it was pretty esoteric. We knew of some cases that were occurring in China. Um, we knew that people were becoming ill, but we really didn't have a clear idea of what was going on at the time. And then this figure was presented that made it a little more tangible for us. And as we began to see cases and, and deaths occur in the US, we began to perceive it as a threat and perhaps even an existential threat at the time. Was this pandemic gonna challenge our very existence? You know, early on, we didn't really know what the fatality rate was. And early on as well, we, um, during the early part of the epidemic, it became apparent that the most disadvantaged in our communities, families living in crowded multi-generational housing, families working low wage, individuals working low wage essential jobs like slaughterhouse workers and families with limited access to healthcare would disproportionately be infected and dying at a greater rate. The bigger the threat, the more likely it is to generate conspiracy theories. Indeed, in 1918, at the time of the flu pandemic, there was a conspiracy theory that suggested that the pandemic was associated with the introduction of the electric light bulb. At one point during the current epidemic, there are conspiracy theories that it was associated with 5G networks, others that suggested it was from the Democratic Party, and another that uh, argued that it was electromagnetic radiation. Threat of climate change uh, is indeed a somewhat existential threat, but for many, it remains very esoteric. And because of its magnitude, it also generates conspiracy theories. But it is indeed very personal. It has consequences for everyone on the planet, our children, our grandchildren. When I was an undergraduate student at Michigan State University, I had a biology instructor named Bromley. And I remember vividly him posing a rhetorical question to us. So what separates us from other species? He argued that all other species can only support the success of their species through reproduction. We now know that there are other species that use or even make tools. However, we're the only species that makes machines, machines that use carbon-based fuels as a source of power. We build dams, change the course of rivers, and build highways. We strip mine coal. We build power plants to burn coal and natural, natural gas to generate electricity to cook, to keep us warm in the winter, cool in the summer, and to keep us engaged with our electronic toys. We congregate in urban, urban centers. And we jam highways with fossil fuel burning vehicles. We also harvest natural resources and other species with little regard to the long-term health of those species um, and their sustainability on the planet. Welcome to the Anthropocene. There are some that are battling about the appropriate name. I'm more interested in empowering you to get involved. The earth is warming due to our use of fossil fuels. So in this hour, I'm gonna give you a little introduction to greenhouse gases and climate science, uh, some of the anticipated consequences, potential mitigation adaptation strategies, and then talk a little bit about political will. But first, a couple of definitions. Um, weather is the short-term short change in the atmosphere, as we see in the, the first uh, top figure, which shows the 
change in temperature and precipitation over a period of time um, of about a week. And the lower figure um, reflects climate, how the atmosphere changes and is defined over longer periods of time. And that figure we're talking about annual days of maximum temperature greater than 85 degrees over a period of decades. Metaphorically, it's the difference between eating a fat-filled biscuit in one meal, but actually maintaining a Mediterranean diet over time. So each day the earth is bathed by solar radiation in the form of electromagnetic radiation. About approximately 30% of the solar energy is reflected back into space. The remainder is retained. If there was no atmosphere present, the energy retained would be insufficient to warm the earth. It would be, we would be in a living or wouldn't be living. Earth would be an ice planet. Fortunately, our atmosphere is comprised of nitrogen and oxygen and the nitrogen, oxygen and water vapor in our atmosphere help retain a portion of the incoming energy and warm the earth. The difference in the incoming and outgoing energy is the net radiative forcing. However, when fossil fuels are burned, carbon dioxide is generated and carbon dioxide is, a more, effect, is more effective at re-radiating this energy back to earth. The more CO2, the less energy that ex is escaping into space, the more energy is retained and the added energy is raising the global temperature. Methane, nitrous oxide, hexafluoride, sulfur hexafluoride, which are products of both natural and anthropogenic processes are also more efficient at reflecting back the sun's radiation and carbon dioxide. So when they're released into the atmosphere, less energy is escaping back into space and the earth is warming. Radiative forcing uses metric tons of carbon dioxide as a base for comparison to compare the radiative forcing potential of, other compound, of each of the compounds. Difference is determined by the heat trapping potential of each of the molecules. Carbon uh, cycles through our atmosphere, soils, vegetation, and surface waters. The ocean and forests are a carbon sink. And the more methane, carbon and other greenhouse gases that are produced, the greater the retention of energy and the consequent rise in temperature. Greater temperatures also increase the atmospheric potential for holding water and increase the potential for precipitation. If we look at the energy grid, transportation, electricity generation and industry contribute the bulk of the atmospheric carbon load. Agriculture contributes about 600 millitons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere each year, about 10% of the total greenhouse gas loading in our atmosphere. Agriculture's contributions uh, to greenhouse gases come from a variety of sources, agricultural soil management, enteric fermentation of livestock, the burning of agricultural residues, crop cultivation, and livestock more manure management. Particular. Methane um, is a greenhouse gas that is a powerful factor in global warming. And the heightened concern about methane is that it's about 25 times more, has about 25 times more global warming potential than the other greenhouse gases. Methane is produced both by natural and anthropogenic sources, and about a third of it comes from wetlands and bogs. There are also anthropogenic sources of methane, coal mining, landfills, um, sewage treatment plants, gas and oil pipelines, manure management on farms, and enteric fermentation by agricultural livestock. There are more than 1.4 billion cattle on the planet, and these ruminants are the primary source of methane associated with enteric fermentation, predominantly beef cattle and dairy cattle. Methane is also generated by bacterial processes and decomposition of animal manure, uncovered lagoons, and from crop residues. Dairy cattle and pigs are the primary source of methane being released from associated with manure management. So how much warming is taking place? The net effect of the radiative forcing is that the earth has been warming since the 1860s and rapidly since the 1920s. 
Temperatures have increased as global carbon emissions have increased and CO2 is projected to continue to increase until we drastically curb the use of fossil fuels. The different scenarios predict increases between three to up to eight degrees Fahrenheit. And we can do at this point very little to avert the lower end of at least a three degree increase in, in global temperatures, but we can still reduce the likelihood of the higher temperatures that are predicted by the end of the century. It's gonna be substantially hotter um, in mid-century, particularly in the Midwest and in the Great Plains. As the temperature increases, we could expect to see more 100 degree Fahrenheit plus days. Last June in Siberia, the land we think of as one of the coldest places on the planet had a temperature of 38 degrees centigrade over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And the highest temperature ever recorded on the planet was recorded last August in Death Valley, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. The primary consequence of the earth warming is a reduction in ice coverage, permafrost and sea ice. The Greenland ice sheet has been undergoing its most rapid decline in hundreds of years. Arctic sea ice during 2019 was at the second lowest record since recordings were established in 1979. Sea ice has lost 40% of its coverage and 70% of its volume since 17, 1979. Some scenarios predict an ice-free Arctic by mid to late century. Albedo is a measure of the portion of solar radiation reflected by the surface. Ice has a higher albedo than soil. As the ice sheets decline, less solar radiation is being reflected and more solar radiation is being absorbed, which is speeding temperature increases and fueling the vicious cycle of ice sheet decline. Less ice, darker land mass, greater absorption of the sun's energy and related warming. This is an, an image from NASA's uh, new Terra satellite which reflects the albedo effect. The darker red areas are the most abundant and most uh, reflected on the planet. Declines in albedo are increasing Arctic temperatures and the Arctic is unfortunately warming at a faster rate than anywhere else on the planet. Areas that were once covered by ice and tundra grasses are now becoming shrubified, growing small shrubs instead of tundra grasses. The loss of ice cover, further reduction in albedo is perpetuating a, a vicious cycle that's continuing the warming of the Arctic. Ironically, there's a little, as the, there's more shrubs exposed and more greenery that's uh, taking root in the Arctic. It can actually serve as a little bit of a carbon sink, but the change from the tundra grasses to shrubs is thought to be contributing to the decline of caribou. Many Arctic species are genetically wired to retain white coat color during usual periods of snow color. However, early snow melt makes them more evident on a dark background and increases predation. When I was putting together a talk, I decided to not talk about polar bears. I just, so um, I include a, a photo of a, a walrus, which is one of the other species which is being impacted by the loss of uh, sea ice and the declining ice sheet. Sea temperatures are rising and anticipated increase by two to three degrees centigrade by the end of the century. And along our coast, elevated sea temperatures have had a devastating effect on coral reefs. The high temperatures are associated with coral bleaching. The elevated temperature prompts the coral to expel their zoanthellae, their symbiotic algae. As sea temperatures warm, species associated with, with warm waters are invading more temperate areas. Lionfish are already altering species diversity and fisheries resources off the North Carolina coast. The species redistribution is also not limited to the ocean. Recent reports of armadillo being reported in North Carolina reflect a move northward that may be associated with increased ambient temperatures. As reservoir hosts redistribute, they can potentially heighten the risk of introducing zoonotic pathogens like leprosy. A shift in the distribution of vectors is also anticipated. There's a new tick in town, the long horn tick, a vector of Thalaria, par Thalaria parva, which is now being seen in North Carolina and other states. Increased winter temperatures are also anticipated to prompt a change in the distribution of mosquitoes. 
An increased range and growing season is anticipated that might prompt the introduction of pathogens like avian and human malaria, dengue, and Zika virus. Temperature shifts are also altering growing seasons, and cherry farmers in Michigan are already noticing the change. Farmers who for generations have grown the same crops will need to rethink um, what they're growing. And agriculture is already being impacted. A good example is what's happening with vineyards in, uh, in California. Warmer temperatures are impacting the ability of uh, grapevines to resist Pierce's disease caused by cephalia fadiosa or fandiciosa, and transmitted by the glassy winged sharpshooter, an invasive uh, species of beetle. Cool winter temperatures have traditionally protected the vines from dying, uh, but warmer, warmer winter temperatures have resulted in the loss of numerous vineyards. Water expands as ocean temperature increases and sea level rises, and some scenarios anticipate sea level changes as high as seven feet. Our nuclear power plants are located adjusting the rivers and large bodies of water to facilitate cooling during operation, and they pose the risk of environmental disaster. Many of our military bases are located along the coast in locations that are severely at risk. A moderate sea level rise of five feet will displace millions from our coastal communities and the cost and generate a cost of hundreds of billions of dollars. The area in red in the map in New York City and New Jersey will be submerged. Some models predict an increased level of seven feet. Warm air holds more water and the duration and level of rain events is anticipated to increase. More tropical storms like Floyd and Harvey are anticipated, storms that slow and dump large amounts of rain. Hurricane impacts communities in three different ways. The one we think most often about is the destructive force of its winds, and there's still some debate about whether or not storm wind speed will increase. But there's no debate about the likelihood of increased storm surge from flooding and saltwater intrusion into coastal lakes and waterways. Hurricanes also prompt inland flooding and more com communities will be at risk of flooding inland as well as along our coast. Another consequence of warming temperature is earlier and more rapid snow melt during the winter. We saw the reflects in 2019 in farming communities and cities along the Mississippi rivers. The flooding markedly impacted agricultural production in 2019. More than 20 million acres were not planted uh, in the Midwest. And the increased flooding is anticipated to heighten the risk of waterborne diseases. Ironically, farmers in the upper Midwest are expected to be hit by extended periods of drought with marked impact on crops. And periods of severe drought are already impacting food security around the globe and threaten the ability of existing crops to feed the 9 billion people that are anticipated to be on the planet in 2050. Severe drought has already been experienced in the Southwest and parts of the Northwest. The Southwest, Lake Mead, created when Hoover Dam was constructed in the Colorado River, is the largest water and reservoir in the country. It provides water to 40 million people in seven states in Mexico and irrigates more than 5 million acres of farmland. This summer, it's anticipated to be at its lowest level since its construction in the 1930s. It's currently at 36% of its maximum volume. Lake Powell, the second largest reservoir on the river, is at 39% of its capacity. If the water level in Lake Mead drops below 950 feet, hydropower production by Hoover Dam will cease. Precipitation is well below the 1981 to 2010 average in the Southwest. And you can see in this graphic uh, image from uh, Lake Powell at the Antelope boat launch, the effect of the drop in uh, water volume in the lake. Drought also increases tree susceptibility to insect predation with insects such as the pine bark beetle. Dead trees provide abundant fuel for wildfires. Extended periods of drought in some areas, notably last year in California and Australia, have already prompted heightened intensity of wildland fires. At times, uh, entire communities have been evacuated and the town of California was absolutely devastated by the campfire in 2018. Once the tree cover is gone due to the loss of vegetation, landslides are more likely. The elevator temperatures are 
already associated with an increased risk of human hospital visits due to heat related illness. The trend is anticipated to continue. As in, you see in the figure on the right, the, both at the lower and upper level predictions for the elevation in temperature, uh, we're gonna continue to see an increase in heat related deaths and increase in emergency room visits as we move to mid and late century. It's the most vulnerable, um, just like in the COVID pandemic, that are gonna be impacted most. The inequities in social determinants of health will help heighten the impact of climate change on the most vulnerable. The indigent, the homeless, children and pregnant women, elderly with limited economic means, and those with pre-existing pre -existing chronic conditions. Depending on the humidity and heat index above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature begins to markedly impact the health of outdoor workers. Farm-based workers are considered to be at particular risk. We've all probably seen a dog running behind a bike or running behind a jogger. Um, Heat-related illness also impacts companion animals. You know, as you know, unlike humans, dogs don't sweat and they dissipate heat through panting, their paw pads and nose. Um, a year or so ago, I was driving along a major thoroughfare in Raleigh and there was a jogger just hovering over a collapsed gold, golden retriever. I walked over and uh, we picked the animal up and rushed into the NC State College of Veterinary Medicine ER. The dog's temperature was 108 and he had to be euthanized. Economic losses of heat stress to US agriculture are thought to be potentially substantial. In 2003, a group at the Ohio State University estimated the annual cost of heat stress to livestock industries I've adjusted those figures uh, for losses uh, for, for inflation. And there is a recent uh, University of Minnesota study that suggested that the impact on the swine industry will be double what I note here, nearly $900 million annually. Animals and people are dependent on evening cooling to provide relief from high, day to, high daytime temperatures. Days and nights are getting hotter and nighttime temperatures have reached the highest level since the 1890s. Elderly without air conditioning, cattle and other species that are dependent on respiration for cooling are particularly impacted. In the Southeast, we've had the highest recorded evening low temperatures for an extended period of time. As shown in this graph depicting minimum daily temperatures from July through June from 1895 to last summer, minimum daily temperatures are increasing. Livestock heat stress will become a growing concern for producers. The thermal neutral zone of, is the range of temperatures with which an animal can maintain its body temperature without altered behavior. I've noted the ranges here in this table um, and the thermal neutral, neutral zone um, you know, will vary with humidity, the type of housing, the ventilation in barns, the species, breed, body size, age of an animal, and geography. In pigs, um, their initial behavior response is usually a decrease in activity, increase in respiration and panning. As it becomes more severe, there's an increase in core body temperature and elevated heart rate. There are marked production consequences that would be economically profound as our globe continues to warm. Uh, they anticipate reduced feed intake, decreases in weight gain, decreases in feed efficiency, inconsistent market weights, which will impact producer profits, higher carcass fat deposits, and reduced carcass quality. During hot per periods, extension agents suggest reducing the stocking density in barns and emphasize the importance of consistent cool water access and effective uh, interior barn ventilation with fans. There's still some debate about the efficacy of sprinklers. Heat stress in cattle can be severe um, and cattle accumulate heat throughout the day and lose heat very slowly um, throughout the night, sometimes taking more than six hours to dissipate the increase in body temperature that uh, they experience during the day. Heat stress in cattle and pasture uh, prompt them to look for shade. And like pigs, breathing may become more rapid with obvious panting. Uh, the production impact is similar to that they anticipate in pigs, 
reduced average rate gain, daily gain, reduced feed efficiency, and then some marked reproductive uh, consequences. They also anticipate uh, that um, milk production and dairy cattle decline. Extension agents suggest uh, for cattle on pasture, ensuring that all animals have access to sufficient shade for every animal in the herd. Um, they emphasize the need to reduce handling during the day, uh, basically letting them rest, uh, and then moving uh, feeding to the evenings and any uh, movement of the animals to the evening time when the temperature is a little cooler. In 2012, uh, we had 300,000 turkeys died from heat stress in 10 North Carolina counties, and that was with an average increase of 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Behavioral response in birds um, is reflected usually with re reduced activity, some huddling, movement towards the walls. They'll spread their wings. Um, they dissipate heat, heat through gola fluttering and panting. Uh, their respiration will increase. Um, they have a re reduction in feed intake and certainly increased water consumption. In preparation for today's talk, I reached out to Eric Gonder, who's with Butterball. And he shared some of the extensive efforts being made by the poultry industry to mitigate heat-related losses. Uh, they're, they're making a movement away from conventional houses to houses with tunnel ventilated systems and evaporative cooling. He emphasized the importance of getting the birds up and moving them during the day. Um, and a key suggestion he had was just to be sure that you've got effective planning uh, for heat, potential heat losses and a really keen attention to barn maintenance. He also emphasized the importance of routinely monitoring the birds throughout the day and communicating um, with barn personnel and veterinary staff on a regular basis. Another challenge for dairy and heat, uh, beef producers will be ensuring there's quality forage year round. There also, uh, some, there's quite a bit of variation um, in how C3 and C4 plants respond to heat. They use different enzymes for photosynthesis. C4 plants are more resistant uh, to higher temperatures and drought. And producers may need to reconsider planting and consider a mixture of C3 and C4 plants. So just in summary, key observations for agriculture are anticipated uh, altered crop and livestock production um, due to heat stress heightened energy usage for cooling, um, the concern about inland flooding, um, concerns about drought, water availability, and heat-related illnesses, potentially in agricultural workers. Now, some critics of livestock industries argue that reducing beef and lamb consumption can result in a reduction of greenhouse gas production. Now, we may have to rethink how we produce food and what we eat. Some of you may have already tried plant-based culture hamburger. It's actually not bad, but the technology itself is not yet carbon neutral. And livestock industries are already taking major steps to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, the dairy industry has been a leader for many years um, in trying to harvest methane and use it as a, a harvest of biogas for power generation on farms. Just an example, um, of some of the things that are being done. Butler Farms in Flat Branch, North Carolina has 10 barns of finished pigs and they've been actively working to reduce their carbon footprint. They have a solar array that supports their ele electrical load. They have a capped lagoon, which they use to capture biogas. And the biogas is pumped to a large uh, generator that's used to power equipment on the farm and electric during the power for electricity. In Duplin County, North Carolina, Optima KV, Optima KV harvests biogas from anaerobic digesters and directs the gas to a processing facility. They're processing waste from 60,000 pigs in their uh, anaerobic digesters. Methane is separated out and is generating 80,000 decatherms of energy each year, enough to power 11,000 homes. The gas is directed to a gas pipeline that's delivered to the local gas distributor. Uh, Piedmont natural gas. We need to be better stewards of our planet. It's our home. Um, we can't solve problems until we accept that we have a problem. 
And to make a difference, we need to build a consensus of the willing and encourage the political will needed to make a difference through both mitigation and adaptation. There have been some positive changes in the US reflected in the reduced use of coal and increase in natural gas and the use of renewable energy sources. But renewable energy sources only represent about 5% of our total energy generation. This is just no longer sustainable. And this is not a realistic form of mass transit. You know, in 1969, we walked on the moon with 1960s technology. It was driven by a national challenge. We need a similar national initiative to combat climate change. We arrogantly think we can technologically tackle any problem. So let's put our arrogance to work, um, but we need to do it quickly. We need to accelerate the use of renewable sources for power generation like solar. We need to enhance opportunities for wind farms and identify ways to protect wildlife so wind power is a little more readily accepted. Will the future include uh, hydrogen fuel cell propelled trucks and cars? Uh, although natural gas is used in, to reduce the hydrogen fuel, fuel cells, the net reduction in CO2 emissions is quite substantial. However, the fuels are expensive and there's no distribution system in the US to support the vehicles but cities like Quebec are taking a lead and recently purchased 50 Toyota hydrogen fuel cell cars. What about nuclear power, which is relatively clean from an energy production standpoint? There's only been one plant constructed in the US in the past 20 years and the average age of our reactors is 37 years. Germany is working to decommission its plants. However, France produces more than 70% 5% of their electrical energy from nuclear power. Concerns about you know, safety are prominent, but perhaps a different kind of nuclear plant is needed. In the 1960s, Oak Ridge National Laboratories pursued what they called the molten salt reactor that used thorium as a fuel source. Unlike uranium, thorium is a fairly ubiquitous compound on the planet. It's the Fuel generation was more efficient, the waste was less hazardous and more easily stored, and shutdown of the plant was extremely rapid. We abandoned the technology back in the 60s. China is now investing heavily in pursuing thorium reactors as one of their potential solutions. It could be a game changer for the planet. Recently, Bill Gates um, has initiated a new startup company called TerraPower, focused on nuclear fission-based energy production. They're working on three different prototypes, um, a molten chloride reactor and a molten salt reactor that uses liquid sodium. These are spin-offs of the Oak Ridge, Pro Ridge project from the 1960s. They're also looking at a technology they call a traveling wave reactor that makes use of depleted, de depleted uranium as a fuel. We need to harness our technical, technical ingenuity um, you know, is this the future of farming? The solar track company is already marketing electrical powered tractors, uh, a good bit quieter and you're not inhaling exhaust the entire time you're at work. New technologies are available uh, for farming. Uh, drones are already being used to monitor herds and crops. Ear tags now help with the physiological monitoring of cattle, which will become particularly more important as the globe warms. You know, currently about 70% of global caloric intake um, is grain-based. And we allocate about 20% of the land in the use for agricultural crop production. You know, a good bit of it's going for ethanol production, majority of it for livestock feed, and only about 20% for direct consumption by the US population. A large portion is producing wheat and grain. And grains that we grow are our annuals and the stubble and ground is reworked after harvest. Plant cover, carbon sink is lost, topsoil and nutrients are lost when the soil is barren. Our monocultures of annual crops also require active application of pesticides. We need to embrace um, regenerative agriculture. I know there's a little debate about what that actually means. Um, to me, it's agriculture first 
focused on the use of perennial grains and other perennial crops that can reduce carbon release and help sustain agriculture's production as a carbon sink for the planet. And we've had more than 570 deaths in the US due to COVID-19. However, our other countries uh, which were much more effective at preventing infections. Taiwan, a country of more than 23 million has had just 12 deaths. So what was the difference? After the first SARS epidemic, Taiwan restructured their public health system. They have universal health care. They have a highly effective system of testing, case identification and confinement. Perhaps most notable was the collective consensus response of the public in which masks were accepted, um, social distancing was accepted and individuals self-confine self themselves when they're ill. In the US, the messaging was inconsistent. We lack community consensus needed to give our politicians the political will to act. And indeed, I mean, we're still arguing about whether or not we should be wearing masks. You know, our planet is warming. It will continue to warm by several degrees. If we're gonna minimize the degree of warming, we, warming, we need to act and we need to act now. We're gonna, if we're gonna sustain food systems, we need to accommodate our continually increasing population to, to accommodate the increasing population, you know, the, to accommodate the population of 9 billion people anticipated to be on the planet in 250, we need to act now. We have the technological prowess and ingenuity to mitigate climate change. We just need to build the community consensus that will give our politicians the political will to act to enact legislation that can make a difference. Thank you. I know I moved a little quickly. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Um, anyone who has a question, um, you can either type it in the question answer section or in the chat and I will um, ask that for you. We've got a few questions here Sure. Um, okay. already. One is asking um, me, um, about mental illness and how mental illness is expected to soar as our planet it becomes unattainable. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. I guess this is not more of a question just yeah, I mean, that's, it's probably a little more geared to a you know, clinical psychologist, but just look at the, the mental health concerns associated with the COVID-19 epidemic, you know, and what, uh, what it's done to just our, you know, our physical health and mental health over the, over the last year. And you can anticipate as people become more concerned, uh, as they see family members um, impacted, perhaps by heat related illnesses, it's gonna have, a, have an effect on our mental well being. Um, we also have a question asking what role is, it for, is there for veterinarians as we uh, work to face this, the yeah. problem of climate change? Yeah, so you know, I'm a veterinarian in the Department of Marine Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, um, co-directing a, a program focused on climate change and, um, we can, the most active thing we can do is actually engaging our clients and talking about it. Those of you that work with production agriculture, you know, making uh, your, your clients aware of what the potential risks, um, they'll, they'll be seeing, you know, these heat related problems. They'll be coming to you for potential solutions um, and uh, looking to you to, you know, guide them towards extension agents to have a little a clear understanding of you know, ventilation systems and the systems and, you know, just as citizens of the planet, we all need to be involved and engaged um, in this debate. We all need to be working to build that community consensus. Um, talk to your neighbors, you know, talk to your friends, a ask them personally how they feel climate change may, could potentially impact their lives. I think, you know, too often we've looked to scientists who throw data at us. And I think it's on the personal level um, that we're gonna be able to enact some change and develop the kind of collective political will to make a difference. Okay. Um, the next question uh, um, is about the bee population. Um, mm -hmm. 
how do you see climate change affecting the bee population, which we all know is very critical for production of yeah. or agricultural yeah. production? Yeah, I'm afraid I don't know enough about apiculture to to, to answer that. Um, but uh, you, I, I guess you could imagine as the crop, the as crops um, that are important for you know they're those crops that, that bees pollinate, you know, as they are impacted by, you know, heat stress, perhaps it may impact uh, you know, food resources available to, available to the bee population. But I think I'm going to leave that question <laughs> to apiculturists. Perhaps there's someone on the, you know, on the call that could, that could help answer that. Um, next question has to do with um, if they, could you comment on the global uh, supply of water for clean potable groundwater? Wow. Um, is this negatively affected by climate change or is that a entirely different problem? No, no, I think it, uh, you know, water is one of our most limiting resources and uh, heat stress countries that are gonna be impacted by extensive periods of drought. And it's all already happening around the globe. I mean, you know, 700 billion people on a planet still, still use surface water as a source of uh, water for their households. You know, there's still hundreds of millions of people accessing um, non-potable water sources. And, you know, in, in some communities where a single well is what's all that's available to support uh, the water resources needed to sustain, uh, you know, a family. And uh, yeah, I think uh, concerns about uh, water availability are gonna be a drastic concern as we move towards mid-century. Mid both through the people on the planet and the livestock on the planet that we're raising and the crops that we're trying to grow to sustain um, you know, the planet's population. Um, got a few more questions here. Um, sure. So what universities are conducting research on mitigation of he high heat in livestocks and can genetic manipulation help? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know uh, too much extensively. I know a little bit about what NC State's doing, you know, and um, you know, we're even looking at alternative, uh, a lot of work being done on um, ventilation systems and, and barns. I think Nebraska has a strong program, University of Minnesota. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm afraid I'm not, not too familiar with kind of the extent of what, you know, extension programs are doing. The next one um, is thank you, thank you for your very comprehensive and informative presentation. I don't recall you mentioning electric cars as an alternative fossil uh, fuel. Uh, this presents a new paradigm, mining of lithium and new waste stream to recycle and recover lithium. What are your thoughts on this? Sure, yeah. Well, you know, electric vehicles um, uh, are still dependent on our natural gas burning power plants uh, for electrical generation. And, um, you know, it, we're, we're moving rapidly towards having, you know, uh, electrical vehicles. And I think what the you know, president's announced by, by two, 250, you know, will be predominantly uh, electrically vehicle based. Um, and you're right. I mean, there are some limitations um, in not just lithium, but, you know, her, um, rare earth elements as well, which we, and we you need extensively for electronics. Um, uh, you know, I think hydrogen fuel actually ha has great potential. It's st still not carbon neutral because natural gas is needed for its production, but there is a great bit of, uh, you know, extensive amount of research being done on different electrolysis processes that uh, don't require carbon-based fuels to generate hydrogen. And um, uh, the tough part is we have no distribution system in the U.S., and that will take a great increase in infrastructure um, fund allocation to build the distribution system needed to use hydrogen fuel cells. Okay, I think we've got four more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Fire away. Oh, somebody just put another one, well, four or five. <laughs> um, as a veterinarian with colleagues in the profession who, who may be very against the contribution of animal agricultural contribution to climate change, what do you say to them and how do you recruit them to, sure. to yeah, how do you recruit them to understand climate change? Yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, agriculture's um, contribution is considered about 
ten percent, about six hundred millitons of carbon a year. And so they they might argue, well, it's just a small percentage of that, uh, you know, total load. Um, but every country get every contribution we can make to reducing carbon based fuels, um, you know, is going to help mitigate the continual loading of um, carbon into our atmosphere. And you know, cattle do contribute to the to the methane load. I'm I'm actually a proponent of the biogas collection. Um, you know, that large plant I mentioned in um, eastern North Carolina I had, I had an opportunity to visit. Um, but I think, you know, and, and I guess one, you know, someone that's a little cynical could say, you know, if you look at that, that initial figure I showed you, that uh, our personal individual carbon footprint is really pretty small when you think about just what we do on a daily basis. But we are, we're dependent on those industries that create uh, you know, the products that we use. And we're certainly dependent on our, our electrical generation grid. Um, so anything that we can do on a farm-based uh, level, like I showed you, uh, you know, considering solar panels, um, where maybe a, a large solar grid can be a net energy producer for a, a, a net energy um, income source for a farmer perhaps, um, where they're selling back to the grid. And I think we need to actually increase opportunities where we can do that more effectively. Um, and I think you need to, you know, and again, on a, just a very personal level, I would hope that perhaps you can, um, by talking about the broader con societal concerns, um, you know, touch them on a personal level to, to get involved and be concerned. Uh, which ag methods, in your opinion, show the most promise for substantially removing carbon from the atmosphere? Okay. Well, um, uh, I think regenerative agriculture is important um, in moving by moving towards perennial grains. We actually created a, a continuous carbon sink for carbon. Um, use of electrical power vehicles, we talked a little bit about the concern, perhaps hydro, eventually hydrogen fuel cell uh, driven tractors. Um, methane capture and biogas production that could be used to power equipment, electricity, generate the electricity needed to operate the farm, uh, you know, all contribute to reducing our, our carbon footprint. Okay, next question. Is the movement towards a more plant-based diet something that has been speculated to potentially help reducing greenhouse gases? So, yeah, that, that you know, is something that is discussed. Um, and I'm not uh, advocating that we, uh, I'm actually a vegetarian, but I'm not advocating that everyone join me in that, um, you know, my lack of uh, meat consumption, livestock, you know, the livestock industry is an important agricultural industry in the U.S. And I'm certainly not advocating that. There are certainly folks that do. If you look at the total um, methane contribution, cattle do play a role. And as I mentioned, methane is a very large contributor, much more so than even carbon dioxide, to the uh, greenhouse gas effect. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I think that's just a personal decision everybody's going to have to make. Last question. China and India together with the U.S. are the top three producers of greenhouse gases. Do you think these three countries will be able to lower emissions or do you see the U.S. doing changes by itself? Why? You know, I hope we, we do see now a commitment in the U.S. to you know, rejoin the Paris Accords um, and work towards, uh, you know, reducing our, the use of carbon-based fuels in the U.S. Um, China and India, you know, they're where we are in some ways, um, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, maybe longer. And, you know, how do you tell somebody that's just begun to have electrical power in their home that uh, you know, we shouldn't be building that coal fire plant that's providing that electricity. 
And China's actually constructed some new plants over the last few years, while concurrently they're working to reduce their carbon footprint um, by looking at uh, alternative nuclear power sources. Uh, but I think China and India are going to have to make a profound um, commitment to reducing their carbon footprint if we're going to be able to mitigate the changes that are taking place by mid-century. I hate to do this to you, but one last question popped up and I feel like we need to look at the other side. (laughs) Um, Are there any potential benefits from climate change for agricultural expanded growing seasons or ranges? It can't be all gloom and doom, right? Um, Yeah. You know, we're, uh, we've got an extended growing season here in North Carolina. So those of us that have our small victory garden, you know, have a benefit from that uh, a little bit. Um, The, it's the extremes that are anticipated, um, you know, the extreme weather events, the extreme periods of drought um, that uh, really place, uh, you know, communities at risk and production systems at risk. Well, thank you again for presenting. It was a great presentation, very eye-opening. Um, I know I myself have been thinking about this and how myself and my family can reduce our carbon footprint, um, especially with Earth Day just a few weeks ago. But thank you, everyone, and have a great evening for those of you on Eastern Time. um, Great afternoon for those of you who are on more West Coast time. Yeah. And if anyone has any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Just shoot me a note. Thank you. Thank you.